The great battlefields of the 21st century are not going to be found in some distant land. They're going to be found inside the human mind. There is a concerted effort right now to shore up support and put in place bulwarks and standards so that the powers that be can control certain elements of the population while preventing others from actually using their mind. In today's video, we're going to talk about this at length, and we're going to use a couple of different examples to show how it's critically important that people start taking a more active role in their thought life. But as always, thank you to everyone who has showed up over at Patreon. I feel it's very important to lead off the videos with thanks and gratitude for those who have actually put their talents where their mouth is and those of you who have joined us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel, you've seen the 30-minute video, the inaugural one. Well, there's another one coming, probably in the next week. And I'll warn you, as graphic as the first one was, the second one might actually cost me a personal friendship. But it's the truth, and it needs to be spoken. So, stay tuned for that. Also, once again, I am very sorry, guys. Last night, I had every intention of streaming on Twitch. There has been these strange hiccups in the internet here in North Florida where it'll just cut out for about a minute or two. Not very long, but completely, and then reset itself. And it does this about every 30 minutes for about a two- to three-hour period in the evening. I'm not sure whether they're doing work or what's going on, but... Lord willing, this won't happen tonight, and we can resume playing Middle-Earth Shadow of War and have the conversation that we always have, gloves off, no censors. So, also, once again, a big thank you to those over at Vimeo that allow me to do the videos on Patreon, completely absent of influence from Google or YouTube. Now, in today's video, we have talked about before this issue with Bitcoin versus the dollar. One of the hallmarks of a scam is that those perpetuating it cannot stand anyone out there calling them out. And they will find these people, and every time it's spoken about, they will, because of the sunk cost fallacy, attempt to defend their bad decision, even when it's clear they've made a bad decision. Now, I have an article today that's going to illustrate the scam, one that everybody can relate to. It won't be complicated. Bitcoin, you try to ask people, please explain Bitcoin. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. But one thing they can't have you doing is thinking. The only thing they need you to do is feel. Now, here's the crux of it. What's the big promise of Bitcoin? The big promise of Bitcoin is if you take your dollars and you put them into Bitcoin, you'll end up with what? More dollars in the future. But out of the same mouth, they will talk about how bad dollars are. Oh, it's a fiat currency and there's nothing backing it and it's going to collapse. Well, if that were the case, why would anybody trade bitcoins for dollars meaning who would sell bitcoin you see that's the thing about the network is that there has to be somebody out there willing to sell you their bitcoins for you to be able to even buy it and what once again is the big promise the big promise is you're going to have more dollars at the end of the day or the six months or the year or whatever but wait a minute i thought dollars were going to be worthless how do they justify having both um, frames of thought? They can't just say Bitcoin is going to replace the dollar, the dollar is going to eventually become worthless, and Bitcoin will become the currency that everybody uses, and you won't be able to transact dollars anywhere. That was their first big selling point, right? Well, now their selling point is invest in Bitcoin. You'll have more dollars. And there's a lot of people that said, well, I did. I bought Bitcoin, and this time ago in the past, and now it's worth this many more dollars. That's right. It's worth this many more dollars. 
See, it's not a transactable currency. All scams initially make a small group of people money. All scams, Ponzi schemes, they initially make a small group of people a lot of money. That's part of the scam. They need testimonials. They need testimonials. They need some people out there who've actually made money. And that's why I have used this black sales analogy, because it's perfect. Between this Guthrie, Eleanor Guthrie character and the pirate captain, Charles Vane, in the beginning of all bad relationships, things are fantastic. You will never talk the person being taken advantage of out of it, because they've never felt anything like it in the world. They're floating on cloud nine. I know a lot of you know what I'm talking about. You are mine and I am yours. If we have to die, we die. Everyone dies, but we live first. Oh, it's so wonderful. Until the scammer loses a little bit of money and reveals who he is. See, this is the place where she confronts Vane about having beaten her own father to death and crucifying him. Because why? Because she cost him a little money and that's what's coming. Now, the article. How Bitcoins 1% control the lion's share of the cryptocurrency. Wait until you read this, and this is all fact. Approximately 0.01%. 0.01% of Bitcoin holders control 27% of the 19 million Bitcoin in circulation. Monday, 20 December, it's good to be the Bitcoin 1%. The top Bitcoin holders control a greater share of the cryptocurrency than most affluent American households control in dollars. Wasn't that the big scam? Oh, the dollar is controlled primarily by the most elitist, and it's completely manipulated. It's even worse in Bitcoin. By orders of magnitude worse. The study showed that the top 10,000 Bitcoin accounts hold 5 million Bitcoins, an equivalent of approximately $232 billion with an estimated 114 million people globally holding the cryptocurrency, and do the math, 114 million out of 6 billion. I want somebody out there down in the comment section to please do that math to show how few people actually hold this cryptocurrency that is the, um, the great equalizer the one that uh, won't be held by just the wealthy. It'll be something where everybody has it, and it'll be ubiquitous. 114 million people out of 6 billion hold Bitcoin. 0.01% of Bitcoin holders control 27% of the 19 million in circulation. By comparison, in the U.S., where wealth inequality is at its most extreme in decades, the top 1%, which is 100 times as much as 0.01, hold about 33% of all the wealth. See, this is, the, this is what they don't want you to know. The study conducted by finance professors and Antoinette Skor at MIT Sloan School for Management and Igor Makarov at the London School of Economics for the first time mapped and analyzed every transaction in Bitcoin in its more than 13-year history. The ramifications of that centralization are mainly twofold, the paper argues. First, it makes the entire Bitcoin network more susceptible to systemic risk. Second, it means the majority of the gains from the rising price and increased adoption go to a disproportionately small group of investors. Despite having been around for 14 years and the hype it has ratcheted up, it's still the case that it's a very concentrated ecosystem. Bitcoin was unveiled in 2008. Software project intended to be an electronic form of physical cash without gatekeepers. Well, what do we know now? Without gatekeepers. Anybody can download the software, become a node on the network, and mine for Bitcoin. Well, what do we know about what a Bitcoin miner costs? Just the setup and the electricity prices. The costs of mining have become so high that only a small group of enterprise-level firms can afford to do it. You see, and that was the result of their promise. See, so they need to keep going out and getting more and more and more cash to dump into it because of this. Actual U.S. dollar cash. This is why so many governments are banning it. The vast majority of Bitcoin's transactions are about 
listen to this guys, 90% of Bitcoin transactions are derived from two activities that have no actual economic function. The first activity is simply the way the network processes Bitcoin transactions. Think of it as the equivalent of making change for $20 when you buy a coffee. The second are transactions sent between wallets by the same user trying to obfuscate their identity, a common tactic for those seeking anonymity. See, they say everything, all the transactions, it's all public, it's all public, not the people. Not the people, not who it is. Of the remaining 10% volume, what the researchers call real volume, trading dominates. Transactions between exchanges and trading desks comprise roughly 75% of that 10%, they said. Scams, gambling sites, illicit uses, 3%. This type of analysis is possible, more so than with physical cash, because Bitcoin runs on a network that records every transaction in a publicly viewable ledger. While user identities aren't tied to those transactions, it's still possible to track and analyze those transactions, determine their use, and discern whether the accounts represent institutions or individuals. So I'll ask one more time. If the big selling point of Bitcoin is that it's a currency, why after 14 years is it accepted virtually nowhere? Why do only 114 million people out of 6 billion have it? And of that 114 million, why is all the wealth concentrated at the top just like with the dollar? If it's an investment, what does the investment promise? It promises what? That in the future you'll have what? More dollars. More dollars. While at the same time trying to demonize fiat currency. Promising you more fiat currency while demonizing fiat currency at the same time. Stop. Think. Act. I'll leave it there. God bless, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time.